So I hope that you'll join me in, in my kind of cause of like, let's, let's bring more units to the market because I'm all about that and how we can do that as a collective group. We can really help solve this problem and benefit both financially because like, I'm not asking you to do this for free. I'm saying you can make a great amount of money. You can create a tremendous amount of wealth, but you can also benefit ethically in helping solve the problem as well, which I think is a great cause to get behind. And it's why I love what the provincial government just did with Bill 23. So let's talk about Bill 23 pretty quickly. Remember at the very beginning of the session when we talked about zoning, I said in Toronto that RD zone, remember that I showed you that was only basically for a detached dwelling? Well now, the province introduced something that says triplex zoning for every single lot in Ontario. Every lot in Ontario is now basically going to be converted to something that allows for at least a triplex. So that's a big change, right? Now, are our municipalities adopting this mandate at the same rate? No, I wish they were, but they're not, right? So some municipalities have adopted it right away. Some municipalities are taking their time with it. But I can guarantee that the federal governments and the provincial governments what they're going to do is with municipalities that take their time on this, they're going to start cutting their funding, right? Or they're going to do the opposite, which is they're going to start incentivizing municipalities that start enacting this. So a municipality can even make more money from the federal government to get more grants if they start implementing these things. Because ultimately it's good for the governments in power if more people are building housing, all that kind of stuff. It's good for votes, right? It's a political thing, yeah. So. so this might be a silly question, but if municipalities are creatures of the province and the province has mandated that you're allowed to do this, how is It's not it, that they're allowed to do it, it's that they have to do it. Fair yeah. But how is it that like Mississauga just the other day said, no, we are rejecting this fourplex as of right. But if it's a provincial law, then like, how can they say that? Is that like, is that legal? Like, how does that work? I'm not a lawyer, uh, but you know, I don't know how that works, basically. But I think that you're gonna see, like I say, you're gonna see some action from the provincial level in some sort of retroactive thing or whatever that, you know, that the, the, provin the province is gonna mandate down on the municipality, right? I think there's no other way around it because, and I, I'm not sure why, I, I get it, because it's political pressure from their constituents saying, I don't want somebody, I don't want my neighbor building a fourplex next to me when I live in this beautiful neighborhood in Mississauga, right? Because as you guys probably know, there's just so much, um, there's so many people that believe when you get into rental housing that all of a sudden you're a slumlord. Well, I'm telling you this right now, I own a bunch of buildings in Toronto and they're incredible. They're nice, they have the best tenants, they've got great, all those things, right? But people don't think about that. They think about a fourplex going in next door and they think that's gonna be some sort of you know, devaluing their property in some way. So, so as a developer, when you're looking at these rules constantly changing, yeah. how do you handle that? Because the same lot in Etobicoke, which is in Toronto, you'd be allowed to do 10 things that you can't in Mississauga. Like, would you just say, I'm only gonna buy in this jurisdiction? Or would you say, hey, I'm gonna buy here because I believe the zoning will be forced to change? Like, like, how do you handle that uncertainty of rules that we know have to change somehow, but we don't know what they're gonna be? Yeah, that's a great question. I think like, what I, I learned this from one of my early mentors. I don't know if uh, many of you have heard of Don Campbell. He wrote a book, it's, it's like a very popular real estate investing book. And one of the things that I learned, yeah, with Rain, and he said like, when there's a new transit line introduced, right? He's like, don't buy when they make the announcement. Like don't buy on that transit line when they make the announcement. He's like, buy when they put the first shovel in the ground, right? Because you know that when the shovel goes in the ground, that project's gonna happen. It might be delayed, it might be over budget, but it's gonna happen, right? Right, and I think that's the same with zoning. If it's in the official plan, that's different, right? If it's in the official plan that they want to encourage development in a, in a given area, you know that those projects are most likely going to get approved. If it's something where maybe the province is mandating it and Mississauga is taking some time to do it, maybe until they change the rule or they say they're going to change the rule, I might hold off on investing in, in Mississauga, something like that. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, make, make those decisions once they happen. So no parkland fees or development charges on additional units. So anything up to uh, four units in Toronto is exempt from development charges. So when I built my triplex in the junction a few years ago, um, I paid uh, $70,000 per unit. We took a single family dwelling and we made a triplex. So there was $100,000, $200,000 of fees 
that essentially under this new plan are eliminated altogether. That makes a big difference on your numbers, right? So that's a huge thing. Uh, new height and density allowances. They're talking about um, major corridors in the city of Toronto. They're talking about making all major streets. They're talking about it. They haven't done it yet, but the moment that they do, you watch what's gonna happen. They're talking about major corridors, making every property allowed to have six story heights on the major corridor. So like, think about a major street, like in my neighborhood, it'd be like Keel, Runnymede, Jane, right? If you're on those major corridors, they would say your height restriction is now six stories versus three, right? That could have a big impact on being a developer in those neighborhoods, right? So keep an eye on all these things. Removal of third party appeals. Uh, this is such a big one, I think, for smaller development projects. So remember that Committee of Adjustments uh, minor variance process that I told you about earlier? Well, what used to be able to happen is your neighbors could show up and say that they didn't like your development project for whatever reason. And then if you got approved at the committee, they could appeal that decision. And all they had to do was file an appeal and pay like a $200 fee. And then you would have to wait 90 days to even be heard at the Toronto Appeal Board. And you had to hire a lawyer on your side and your neighbor could just show up as an individual and say, I don't really like this development project. They didn't even really need to have a good reason to appeal your decision, but it would tie you up for another 90 or 120 days. Well, with this rule, what they said is only the applicant, the municipality or the minister can make an appeal. Why would the applicant make an appeal? Good question, I don't know. I don't know why an applicant wouldn't make their own appeal, but maybe, I don't know, obviously there's precedent for it somewhere. But, so that's a big change there, right? Just again, fast tracking the process a little bit. Development charges, community benefit charges, and parkland dedications. So if you look at the development charges this year versus last year, if it's a purpose-built rental, they've gone down over 25%. That's a big change, right? So adding units now is about $50,000 per unit at a two bedroom if you're gonna do a purpose-built rental versus like almost $75,000 last year. It makes a big difference in your numbers. And if you're doing affordable housing, your development charges are waived. So they're exempt from development charges. Here's my favorite one. Anything under 10 units, site plan control does not apply. Let me tell you a little story about our Glen Lake project. Uh, on the corner of Glen Lake and Keel, for those of you that know that intersection, we bought a single family dwelling and we planned to convert it to a uh, eight unit apartment building. So because they considered it a new build and a new apartment, we had to go through site plan control. Site plan control can take anywhere from 12 to 18 months. And that's if everything goes well. And in site plan control, the municipality has a lot of power. They can tell you what they want your building to look like. So they want us to build it out of brick, right? Which is an expensive material. Uh, I like brick, but it's, it's not the most cost effective for a rental property, right? Um, they wanted us to you know, have all kinds of different things and they get to make all of those decisions. Plus they wanna see all the studies, right? A shadow study. They wanna see a parking study. They wanna see all these different things. They, they asked us, we had submitted the application and it was all in, we gave them everything they needed, including an environmental, including all of these different things. They came back and they said, can you guys do um, a methane gas study? I said, what is that? They said, well, there used to be a, um, a garbage dump. And I said, where? They said, we don't know exactly. It was somewhere in the area. I'm like, how many years ago? They're like, we, we don't know. <laughs> but could you do this methane study just to make sure there's no methane? I said, how much? So I called my environmental consultants and I said, how much is this thing? They're like, well, it would have been $5,000 when you drilled first time around. I said, what is it now? They said $20,000. Great. So the city just added that one more thing in site plan control. After the fact, I got to go spend another $20,000 to dig holes in the ground for some site that may or may not have methane on it that they don't know exactly where this garbage dump was. That's the kind of stuff they can throw in front of you for site plan control. So Bill 23 got enacted in late December and it was passed with royal assent, which means that you have to implement it right away. 
City of Toronto did. We got a call in January for our project that was under site plan control and they said, uh, you don't have to go through site plan control anymore. You can go straight to get your building permit. I was like, great, can I get the last year of my life back and the $250,000 I spent? They're like, no, but uh, have fun. You can go straight to building permit now, right? So now anything under 10 units, now don't get me wrong. If it's not zoned for it, you still have to go through zoning. But what did I tell you about the R zone in Toronto? Are we allowed to do apartment buildings? Yes. So if it's anything under 10 units, and you don't need a minor variance, even if you do need a minor variance, that's three or four months, no big deal, right? But now you can go straight and get a building permit. And you can start building a 10 unit building in Toronto with this new bylaw that's, or this new uh, rule that's been enacted. So this is a huge game changer. And all over Ontario, I'm seeing various projects uh, with 10 units and under that are avoiding site plan and getting into the ground much quicker. Yeah. Is there a Bill 23 across other provinces as well, or it's just in Ontario? Uh, there's lots of different things happening in, in a lot of different provinces. Yeah, but I don't know the specifics of every single province, but I would I'm say trying to right? across the board, it, almost in every province, there's some sort of measure that's been introduced. Calgary just introduced universal zoning, basically saying that they've eliminated um, you know, their, their kind of single family dwelling zoning. They're saying that every a uh, lot in the city of Calgary is uh, now zoned for a multiplex. So you're seeing it in, in different municipalities across the country. The okay? development charge ex <coughs> exemption for affordability, same criteria as the MLI criteria? With affordable housing, I'm not sure if it's the same as MLI or if it's city of Toronto affordable housing, which is a very different thing. And the reason somebody asked about it earlier, with city of Toronto affordable housing, they give you a list of organizations that you can work with and you have to place people that actually need affordable housing. So you have to work with one of those organizations to put somebody in those units that needs affordable housing. I think that that's what that is, where you'll get development charges exempt. Yes? So the 10 units is under R zoning or R D zoning? No, R D zone is what? So R D prior to this was only for single family dwellings. Now with RD zoning, you can do a triplex. With R zoning, you can do anything. But 10 and under doesn't have to go through site plan approval. Removal of upper tier municipality planning responsibilities. I'm not gonna get into the rental replace. I've got a great story about rental replacements. I'll tell you guys that one in the course. It's a long story about Oakmount actually, but I'll have to save it for another day. Uh, the reduced role of conservation authorities. Hey, I'm, I'm all for saving the environment. I think we need to do a lot when it comes to that. But conservation authorities have had a lot of power to sort of restrict development. So I think there's, there's somewhere striking a balance now between the, the need for housing and the need to make sure that we still have, you know, birds and fish and things like that. Those are very important things. Uh, changes to the Ontario Heritage Act. <laughs> Uh, so they have a, a reduced ability for the municipalities to designate properties under the Ontario Heritage Act. So that also helps with development um, as well in terms of uh, making sure that these projects can get built. So Bill 23 is a, is a significant game changer for you as a developer, and it's definitely something that you want to pay attention to on all of your future development projects. If you're interested in learning how to be a developer, you can always check out my website at darrenvoros.com for all of my course details. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram where I post regularly. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on Tuesday.